Welcome to 28 and Searching. I'm your host, Samantha, and today I have Elizabeth Atchison with me. Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks for coming on my show. Hey, Samantha. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Elizabeth. Where, where are you currently at? How old are you? How many years have you been in your career? Stuff like that. So I am based in Seattle, although about, I would say about 40% of my clients are from outside Puget Sound. Okay. And that's because I've been a career coach for about 20 years. Oh, wow. And yeah. And so people who, you know, have worked with me before, if, you know, if they had a good experience, they <laughs> will want to work with me again. And so I have... I'm just very lucky. I have really good word of mouth. So uh, uh, most of my practice, the vast majority of my practice is referral. And um, it's, but it's really fun. I love living in Seattle and feel very lucky that I can do something that I love so much. That's awesome. So what exactly is your job title and what does it mean you do? So I named my practice Blue Bridge Career Coaching, and my title here is really just career coach because that's what I do. It's pretty <laughs> simple. Okay. I am a career coach. So, and in that role, I do a variety of things. I help, one of the big things I do is help people figure out what they should be moving towards in their career. I, I work with a lot of people who feel really stalled and bored or even downright miserable. And I um, give them a career assessment, which I actually developed myself. Oh, very and, cool. Yeah. And then I um, read the the completed assessment I also look at what they've been doing so far and I meet with them and I figure out I help them figure out um, their direction whether that's a target field or a target occupation or something like that so that's a big thing I do the other thing I do is help people who maybe are mid-career and just feel like they're not progressing as quickly as they wish they were. Mm -hmm. And I help, I help them to de develop um, strategies to move their career forward, whether that means going from being a solo contributor to being a manager or going from being a manager or director to a member of the senior leadership of a company or whatever it might be. And then less frequent, and, and then <laughs> it's funny because I really have so many different types of clients. Sometimes people will contact me and they literally just want help preparing for a particular job interview. They've landed the job interview of their dreams and they just want help getting ready for it. And I don't mind those kind of shorter engagements at all. That, mm -hmm. you know, whatever someone wants, I'll help them with. And then less frequently, I work with people um, towards the end of their careers when they're maybe, say, 45 or 50 and are trying to figure out what to do in the next, let's say, 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, but that's... I would say that's only about 15 or 20 percent of my practice. Most of my practice is the stuff I described before. So it's pretty much all adults all the time. <laughs> well, that, well, that's good. And so when you're when you're talking about careers, you're talking about mostly in other companies. You're you're not dealing with the business and you're dealing with the individuals. Yes, okay. I, I work, my clients are individuals. Um, having said that, I give a lot of workshops. So um, I give my own m workshop once a month. It's called Tools for Transition. And I give it once a month except for August because everybody needs a break. <laughs> um, at at different locations all over Seattle, Capitol Hill, Wallingford, Mercer Island. And that workshop is open to anyone. And I intentionally keep it um, at a low price. It's $98, which for a six-hour workshop is 
That's crazy. Great. It's yeah. a crazy good deal. Yes. Um, and then I also give workshops to University of Washington alumni and Seattle University alumni, where I partner with the alumni offices of University of Washington and Seattle University to um, develop an offering that will be attractive to their alumni, get them to come back to campus, get some career advice. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's just that that kind of thing is really great because alumni offices are always looking for ways to engage their alumni. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, so I, I give, I do give a lot of workshops and that's, that's just an example. I also, I don't know. I seem to get contacted fairly often just for, weird things that people (laughs) want me to do yeah yeah well and I really enjoy the chance to create new content Mm -hmm. you know that that's always really fun for me because and I would say that the thing Samantha that really it works well about my practice is that the individual coaching informs the workshops Mm-hmm. In in the sense that because I'm working with individuals who are actually in the job market all the time, um, when I'm giving a workshop, I can give a lot of examples. I don't ever use people's real names, and I usually don't. You know, I try to disguise the circumstances as much as I can because client confidentiality is a big deal. Yeah. But... Um, I can bring that sort of real world experience in because I'm basically by their side from the moment, you know, they start working with me, assuming they want me to be by their side the whole time. Sometimes people just come and say, hey, I need you to help me figure out what I should be doing and then (laughs) I'll be fine. I'll go out and and then I'll go out and do it. But I would say a lot of the times people also need help with the kind of tactical aspects of job searching. Um, and I, I really give people a lot of coaching on things like networking and doing informational meetings and that sort of thing, because the statistics are just staggering on the, the degree to which you, you, you know, you're so much more likely to get into an interview pool if you were referred by someone. Yes. And you're five times more likely to get the job if you were referred by someone. And this is the killer for me. Your average starting salary is going to be 6% higher if, again, if you were referred by someone. Oh, my goodness. I know. It's pretty amazing what That's the numbers That's pretty crazy. I did not know that last bit. I knew about the referral process because I've heard about, you know, especially when you're looking at big companies like Seattle, like yes. Boeing and Amazon. When you know somebody, it's a lot easier. yes yes that is that's exactly right but I didn't know about the salary that is pretty crazy that's I mean that is yeah I mean that just shows a lot of the jobs I've um, done interviews with talk a lot about about networking Um, and that just shows that that's a huge part I mean that you're saying that almost every client you need to talk about with networking yeah It's true because people, even sometimes people who are really, they they think of themselves as really people oriented, networking just plain makes people uncomfortable. They, (laughs) they feel that they're, I mean, right? Yeah, that's true. They feel that they're imposing on people. They feel they're wasting people's time. They're asking for something, but not giving them something and I really try to normalize the process for people and help them realize that savvy professionals know that this is how you do it this is how you make career transitions so it's I, I and I think in a way that's part of why a coach is helpful in this process is that a coach can you know, really just tell you, this is totally okay. Yes, go and do it. <laughs> go and do it. Be a cheerleader. Yes, be yeah. a cheerleader. I, I often talk to clients about the ramp onto the freeway. I'll say, look, you know, we're not going to put you 
on a, from a side street onto the freeway. Let's mm-hmm. have you get on the ramp first. Yeah. And so pick an event that is just really easy for you. Maybe it's your neighborhood block party or your, your in-laws, you know, holiday gathering or whatever it might be. Just pick something and then go to that event with the intention of sharing your narrative with people and asking them if they happen to know someone in your target field. Because once you start asking people if who they know, you just open these glorious, I mean, it's, it's really amazing how people want to help you if you are explicit about what, if you're very clear about the direction you're going, your excitement about it, and you make a very specific ask. So I really coach people on that process. And it, it's amazing how well it works. I, I routinely see clients who, you know, they've been getting their resume ready and their LinkedIn ready, and they have all the pieces in place. And then they start the networking and informational meeting process and all of a sudden, it's like the the toboggan picks up speed and they start <laughs> flying down the hill. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. It's it's a really powerful process to accelerate people's momentum. Yeah, I've definitely learned a lot about networking doing this podcast because mm. I have to. I have to, I talk to people about it everywhere because you know, I I never know who's going to be that person. So it's super important for me to talk to everyone and anyone. And I've done silly things like have a sign that says, talk to me about your job. And people are really (laughs) responsive. They actually, I mean, I've had a way larger um, pool of people that have been like, I love this. Yes. I want to help (laughs) than I anticipated. That's so, that is great. Yeah, people really do want to help other people. They do. I'm absolutely convinced that that's true. And it's the power of obligation, right? Because you learn that in sales. Like, if you if you make somebody feel like, you know, will you pay them a compliment? Like, oh, you know so much about this. And then you say, can you talk to me about it? It's almost like they feel like, yes, you've just paid me a compliment. I absolutely need to talk to you about this. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of sales techniques, things like making the ask, mm-hmm. are completely applicable in the job search process. And I, I think in some ways a big reason that I'm able to be a career coach is that I had a marketing career for about 25 years before I became a career coach. Okay. And as part of that marketing career, you know, sales and business development was also part of it. And I just, all of those techniques, you know, come into play at different times um, yeah. when you're, when you're a career coach. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's, kind of where I was going with the next question is like, where, how did you get, how did you get to being a career coach? What did you, I mean, you did marketing. Did you do marketing for yourself or did you? No, I, so I, so I, my undergraduate major was psychology Okay. and then, and then I spent the next 10 years. Well, right afterwards, I, I worked for an ad agency for about five years doing media planning and account management with different consumer products companies. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my first introduction to marketing. And I really liked it. And um, from there, I worked in basically for a number of years in the natural foods industry, where I did marketing communications, I did some public relations type stuff. Um, marketing strategy. I worked for a consulting firm that specialized in the natural foods business. That okay. was super, super fun. And I also co-founded a nonprofit organization that lasted for 11 years. And oh, that wow. was an, yeah, that was an amazing organization in, or an amazing experience in the sense that I learned how to fundraise and how to build a board and how to sort of do strategic planning and all of those kinds of things that you that you do when you're 
kind of building an institution. Mm -hmm. And then I went to business school and I got an MBA. And I, I think, um, I think for me, the MBA really was the most key in, in terms of my educational credentials to be a career coach. Mm -hmm. I think the MBA was by far the most important. You know, there's no question that you have to have people skills, you have to have intuitive skills, you have to have, um, you know, kind of a, a very strong desire to help people. Mm -hmm. But there's no way I could be a career coach if I didn't understand the economic landscape. And that is, um, I, I really feel that understanding the dynamics of the economic landscape it is what helps me be a good career coach. Because, you know, when you're guiding people towards what they should be doing, you don't want to guide them towards something that's going to go away. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yep. You want you want to guide them towards something that's growing. I one way I say it to people is that you want to identify the intersection between the valuable and the rare. Mm -hmm. So if you can vector towards you know a set of skills that are both valuable and rare in the job market, you're always going to get a job. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that I found, even just doing, even just doing this podcast is I had talked to a woman who is an accountant and she had told me that accounting had evolved so much from what people had expected it to be. Because at one point it was, you know, you could kind of be an introvert and it was the like, you know, creepy back office. They'd be by themselves <laughs> all the time. Kind of, you know, that's that's what the stigma was. Right. And right. she's telling me that now they have to become um, almost analyzers of the data and they have to be very personable and be team oriented. And she said that yeah. they know that 90% of their job's going to be automated in like the next 20 years or whatever. And so it's almost important. I would figure to be a career coach that you keep that in mind too, because if it evolves and personalities don't mix any longer, it kind of, yes. it, it doesn't serve the client that you're putting into a field. That's really not going to work. In right. Five years. Right. No, I think that's really true. I would say the other thing that really qualified me to be a career coach is simply that I've always, for really as long as I can remember, um, I've just if if I'm, you know, on a on an airplane or a train and or at a party, at a dinner or at a wedding, and there's someone there who isn't happy professionally, mm -hmm. that's, that is the person I want to talk to. It's, <laughs> it's almost, I mean, it's really strange. I, I sort of think of myself almost like, you know how first responders, when a bomb goes off or something horrible happens, they run towards the bad thing. Yeah. I, I am like that with career situations. I, if I, if I know that someone in the near vicinity isn't happy professionally or is in the midst of kind of a big, hairy transition. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm like a first responder. <laughs> I run, I'm there. I just want to go talk to that person. And I, you know, part of it is, I think I'm just really fascinated. And this goes back, I think to my psychology major. I've always been really interested in what motivates people mm -hmm. and so and my career assessment in many ways is based on is designed to answer that question because if you can take what somebody you know what what they're really interested in what they love to do and what matters to them like what brings them meaning and purpose in their life mm -hmm. And if you can kind of match that up with needs in the economy, or as I said, that intersection of the valuable and the rare, you're just going to help someone so, so much. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's, 
Uh, my father used to always tell me that you had you had to love what you do. You spend way too much time at work not to. Yes. Um, and, you know, I've, I've kind of stuck to that because I feel like that's a, you know, it's a pretty big deal, right? A lot of people feel like they have to be miserable. And I yeah. just, I, I don't believe that. I think it takes all kinds. Like, I don't think every yes. job's built for everybody. But I think yes. there's a job for everyone. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's really true. Now, to be fair, I because I want to explain this since you asked kind of how I became a career coach. Sure. There there was a moment in 1997 when someone who knew me well said to me, and I still remember his words to this day. His name was Richard. He said, Elizabeth, you have a gift for working with people in transition and you should be using that gift. So at, at that moment, I realized, oh my gosh, <laughs> that's it. That that's is your a, moment. <laughs> that is the moment. You know, and I was lucky. Most people, Samantha, are not that lucky. They have to figure it out themselves. But this guy hit the nail on the head. And almost immediately after that, I started scouring the, you know, the internet. I started going to, um, you know, professional associations like the National Career Development Association. I started going to their meetings. I started doing informational meetings with people who worked as career counselors in colleges and universities. And, uh, you know, when I started that, pro because you never really know until you kind of take those first few steps yeah. into the field. But at every step, I, I was I, I was just so excited by what I was finding. I mean, I, I just was getting more and more just enthused about this new path and, and realizing that it was such a great fit for me. So, in fact, it was funny because I one of the first informational meetings that I did was with a career counselor at Stanford University. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember coming, which I, I had gone there twice. I had gotten two degrees from Stanford. So I thought, well, they have to give me an informational meeting. They can't say no. <laughs> right? Yeah. So no, they owe I, you at this point. <laughs> I think they, they owe me. So I, I went in. I talked to this guy. His name was Lance. And I was very strict. I only talked to him for 20 minutes. And as I let, you know, asking about what he did and what did he like about what he did and what were some of the challenges that he saw coming down the road and blah, blah, blah. And I left that meeting and I was walking back to my car under the hot California sun. And I literally felt like my feet were going to fly out of my shoes. I was <laughs> so excited. I was like, oh. I want to do this job right now. So that's how I became a career coach. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty fantastical way to step into a career. Um, yeah. And it doesn't to, happen very often. No, you know? no, it doesn't. Some people yeah. have to go through a lot of different, and some people I've heard hated their jobs in the beginning and then loved them. <laughs> yes. So yes. it, it all happens a little bit differently. Yes, but if it we does. take if we take a step back to what you're talking about uh, about schooling, you said that your MBA was the most important piece because of the learning the economic landscape, right? Yes. Would you say that if somebody if somebody wanted to go into something like this, would they need to do that? exactly or maybe go into you know maybe into a business degree or maybe a financial background or marketing or do you, you know, think that there's anything better or worse no not necessarily i think there are a number of different ways into this path and um one really common way is for people to become a career counselor at a college or university okay and there are even master's programs in um, student services with an emphasis on career services. Oh, I did not know that. That's very cool. Yeah, I think 
the last one I remember looking at was either at UC, no, wait a minute. It might have been, it was either University of San Francisco or UCSF. I, I remember just logging in my head that there was a program like that in San Francisco somewhere. Yeah. Um, and I, I do think that especially like, so I'm getting close to the end of my career. I'm significantly older than a lot of other career. I mean, I'm in my sixties and, <laughs> okay. you know, so you're a, you're a lot younger than that. I would say for someone on the younger side of wanting to start in this field, that the career counseling in colleges or universities would be a great place to start. Um, because, you know, the, the, those career centers in universities are under a lot of pressure these days. Yes, a lot. You know, to show, you know, the return on investment to the parents or whoever is paying those bills. And they, they're they often staffed by people who are very capable. I mean, I'm friends with a lot of career counselors. Yeah. Um, and they're great people. So I, I think that's a really good place for a younger person to start this kind of career. Um, I, I have the, the people I know who have gone into private career coaching, as I have, mm -hmm. either had, a, you know, an MBA and a pretty good chunk of a career behind them themselves as, mm -hmm. as in like 10 or 15 years, mm -hmm. because, you know, a big part of what you learn when you're working is, um, you know, what's it like to hire someone, How, you know, when you're a, the hiring manager or the HR person who's looking at a stack of resumes and cover letters, what is it that you're looking for? And if you've never had that experience, it it's tough to just kind of invent that as you go along. Yeah, I kind of know what to do if you're not on the other end, because it sounds like a lot of your career was learning the business side of hiring, right? Because you were marketing to consumers from the business perspective. So you learned a lot about how businesses run. And basically what, how I see it is you've just taken that and now you're giving that information to the individual that, so they can get in. Yeah, that's true. And then there was, I think, a separate piece, which was that in one, two, three, in four different places that I worked, I they were too small to have an HR function. So I kind of functioned as the HR person. Okay. So I, I was doing recruiting and I was also doing outplacement. Like when someone left mm -hmm. the company, I was like, ooh, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> and so would you say that might be also another alternative? Because I know that a lot of yeah, counselors in universities definitely. require a degree. Whereas you can be an HR assistant without a degree or while you're getting a degree. So would you yes. say that that might be a good alternative beginning point? Yes. I, I do think that working in HR, especially on the recruiting, onboarding, um, you know, those types of or, or possibly outplacement, I, I think I think that would be a good background. As long as you the thing is, you still have to get that sort of economic landscape piece going somehow. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it could certainly be an undergraduate business degree. I don't think it has to be a graduate business degree at all. Sure. But I, I do think you want to know the basics of just how the economy works. And yeah. Yeah. So, and beyond that, sort of having a sense of marketing is certainly very helpful because, you know, you're basically positioning people in the job market, which is market, you're sort of marketing people. Oh, yeah. There's that whole revolution about branding yourself, right? A lot of people make yes. livings off of brand. You're essentially doing that for somebody else. Yes, exactly. Okay. And just a side note question. Do you ever find it ironic that you're, base, you're, you're your own business owner who's putting people in other companies? <laughs> 
Like, you don't do freelance, you know? Like, do you ever tell somebody they should go into business for themselves, or do they only go into other companies? No, actually, that's a great question. I actually do work with a lot of people, and especially people over age 50, because ageism is a huge factor in the job market. But before 2008, ageism kicked in at age 60, but now ageism starts to be felt when a person is 50 and even 48, 49, the closer you get to 50, oh my gosh, ageism is so real. So what I'm doing with a lot of my clients who are over 50 is helping them identify um, any area of knowledge that they could monetize and somehow, whether it's through a consulting practice or a lot of times just through contracting mm-hmm. or maybe starting their own business. You know, some of my clients end up buying into a franchise and they're great franchise brokers in pretty much every major town, um, you know, who can have work with you to figure out which franchise would be a good fit for you given your um the kind of lifestyle you like to have Mm -hmm. um so yeah i would say oh gosh a good 10 percent of my clients are are people i I, just a few days ago i was talking to a client in his 30s who is just passionate about custom furniture design yeah and um I actually had him do a complete a career assessment for me because I kind of wanted to make sure that this really was his thing and there wasn't something else where he could just go and get a nice job with a paycheck and benefits. But, <laughs> but he was incredible. He was thematically very consistent in his interests and his skills and um, his values. And, Uh, So I'm, you know, I ended up recommending to him that on a, you know, and you always have to find out from people um, what their circumstances are, because that their sort of personal circumstances, whether they're married, do they have kids, do they have a partner, do they have any dependents, you know, all of those kinds of things are really important because you can't give this kind of advice in a vacuum. So Mm -hmm. that's almost always my first set of questions revolves around, um, what I, what I call their ecosystem. Yeah. And this guy just happened to have an ecosystem that for at least a few months could allow him to go big with his idea to really give it a shot. I, I think, He'd been reluctant to do that. He kept thinking he should be doing something else. And I said, look, you've got to at least find out. Just go as big as you can for, let's say, up to six months. And he did have the financial flexibility to do that. And so that's what I recommended. Now, somebody else, if they didn't have that financial flexibility, I would probably not have made that recommendation because you really do have to be practical with yeah. people, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So, okay. So in, when you talk about personality assessments, because you, you give those to your clients, right? So do you what, what kind of personality would you say would fit into what you're doing? So, and just to be clear, I don't actually give personality assessments to my clients. I give a career assessment. Okay, and okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's the career assessment is aimed, it's a three-part, it's basically a Venn diagram. It's the doing circle, the thinking circle, and the believing circle. And I have a set of questions for those three circles. And the doing circle is about identifying your favorite skills Mm -hmm. The thinking circle is about identifying the topics and the subject matter that interest you the most. Mm -hmm. And then the believing circle is about identifying your values. So what matters to you and brings meaning and purpose to your life? Um, I would say that the, the, the characteristics that you need to be a career coach, Mm -hmm. the biggest one by far 
is an insatiable curiosity about people. Um, because I, I, it's almost indescribable how, what a variety of people I work with. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I'm sure. Uh, and, and to me, that is part of what makes the job so interesting. I love that. But if you were only a little bit interested in people and you weren't curious about what motivates them or what their ecosystem is, I, you would be a very unhappy career coach. <laughs> so, yeah, I, probably so not I, it then. <laughs> yeah, you would not want to do that. So I'd say that's the number one thing is just a, an incredibly keen and almost insatiable interest in people. And then the second thing that I think is just an absolute requirement is um, an interest in the landscape of our economy, whether that's the, the Seattle economy or the regional economy or the national economy or even the global economy. I am very intentional about reading just blogs and posts from thought leaders and this and that, just to just so I can kind of stay on, stay in touch with with how how where things are going, so that I can um, advise my clients. And of course, there's so many great resources. The Occupational Outlook Handbook um, from the U.S. Department of Labor is just an amazing resource, and. There are lots of other great resources, too, but I, I think if you didn't have a, a sort of interest in the economy, and by the way, I'm not interested, just to be clear here, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not interested in economics. Like, I had to take two economics classes when I was in business school, and mm -hmm. I was miserable. <laughs> but I really am not kidding. I just, oh, it didn't make any sense to me at all. But I love reading articles about trends in different industries and, you know, what's what's happening in different industries and how things are consolidating or how, you know, how new industries are being created or how different industries are being disrupted. Like all that kind of stuff is really, really interesting to me. So I'd say those are really the two um, the two key factors. And I guess the the other thing probably I should mention is a generally compassionate, kind nature. Um, you know, because it's hard to be in transition and yeah. and you really I, I I often feel that I you know, I, I feel that I take care of my clients or I, I, or I try to take care of them. I try to be kind to them. I try to be supportive of them. So there's sort of a nurturing, compassionate aspect. So, yeah, I would say it's those three things that are, that are crucial. Which is interesting because um, in a lot of the research that I've done, uh, you don't hear as much about the economic factor, even though trends, I can absolutely see your point in what you're talking about, the, you know, knowing what the job market's doing and what different industries are doing. But a lot of people skip over that because when they think about coaching, they think just about the emotional support rather than the more factual portion of it. So I'm glad you brought that up because it, it sounds like that would make you a better career coach you'd be happier at doing it yeah I'm not sure you could be a career coach if you weren't interested in the economic landscape and and I don't mean just business obviously I mean arts I mean nonprofits, yeah. mission-driven organizations I mean they're you know government agencies I mean all of those things are really um you know they're part of the economic landscape yeah, absolutely. So since those are the personality traits that kind of work, what would you say are the personality traits that absolutely are not going to work? Like if you feel like if you're an introvert, this isn't for you or what, what kind of things are, would make it very obvious you would not want to be a career coach? Um, actually, I think an introvert would be just fine as a career coach. I don't think you need to be extroverted to be a good career coach. I think if you have 
Um, I, I'd say the only thing that would make you not a good career coach is if you were not interested. I mean, it's basically the flip of what we were talking about. If you're not that curious about people and you're not that interested in the economic landscape, you should not become a <laughs> career coach. Okay. Please, okay. please don't become a career coach. Just you don't go a, down there. <laughs> don't go down that road. You're going to make a lot of people unhappy. But in terms of personality, I, I think a wide range of personalities would do just fine. Um, I, I, I don't see personality traits as being predictive or not predictive of success in this career. The, the only thing that I think, um, in, in terms of the coaching itself, the only thing that I do think is helpful if you were building a business as a private career coach, as I have, is um, to have an interest in marketing and putting yourself out there. If you're someone who struggles, say, with public speaking mm -hmm. or, um, you know, reaching out to people and that sort of thing, I, that would be tough to do it on your own. Because I know that part of the reason I've been able to build my own practice is that I like people so much that it's very easy for me to reach out to people. I just figure, Hey, I'm going to meet somebody new. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, but you're saying that if like, even if you have an interest in career coaching, you don't, you can either do it yourself or go into a business and do it. And your personality would kind of come into play depending on which way you want to go. Yes. And, and I, so I think, um, you, the other place where you can, so you can be a, a self-employed career coach, as I am. You can be a career counselor in a college or university, or you can join a company like Matt Youngquist's company he, or Laura Poepping's company. I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. Sure. But those, those are a couple of Seattle companies that employ multiple career coaches. Okay. And so... And that would be another route. Um, you could also work for a company um, like Waldron, um, which is also here in Seattle, or Lee Hecht Harrison, which I think is in Bellevue. And these are companies that get hired. Um, I mean, they do a lot of different kinds of things, but among other things, they help companies with outplacement and they, you know, like, let's say you're getting laid off by someone. Like a temp be, agency. N no. Um, okay. These are, so let's say you work for a firm and that firm has to do a massive layoff. What they might do is give you an outplacement package that includes career guidance from a company like Lee Hecht Harrison. Oh, okay. Or, that makes sense. Right. So... That's another place that a career coach could work is at a place like Waldron or Lee Hecht Harrison. Um, so, yeah, I think those are the main, you know, sort of join a, be your own private practice or join a small practice like Matt Youngquist or Laura's firm, which is called Plum, or... Um, join a company like Waldron or Lee Hecht Harrison and do outplacement or, and I know they also do just some career coaching stuff mm -hmm. as well. Um, okay. or, or work for a college or university or graduate school. You know, a lot of graduate schools also will, um, piggyback on the career center of that university. And so you could be, for example, um, working for a law school, helping their help, helping law newly minted JDs get jobs in the law field. Cool. So yeah. So, so there's a lot of different stuff you could choose. Yes. Cool. Yes. Yes. So in your experience, what do you think is a part of your personality that struggled with your career choice? What's something you've had to either meld your career to, or maybe change yourself to fit a little bit better? You know, I think the biggest thing is that in all of my other jobs, I, until I became a career coach, I was kind of a leader in the organization. 
whether at the lower level, the middle level, or the upper level. And as a career coach, you're just an advisor. Mm -hmm. So I've had to kind of put my own um, leadership tendencies kind of on the back shelf. And, yeah. and I, and I, you know, I find some ways to, to, um, to, to allow that part of me to, to be expressed. I'm, I'm very active, for example, in the Stanford Business School alumni chapter here in Puget Sound. Mm -hmm. And so that's certainly a place where I can let my leadership skills show. Um, but it, but it's very different to go from being in an organization and managing people and also having people that manage you just to, to being an advisor all by yourself. Yeah. And, and that's, that's tough. I, you know, I certainly have days where I'm just like, Oh, I just wish I could like go to the coffee <laughs> train and chat with people, you know, have, yeah. have this, how was your weekend? You know, I, I love doing that. It was fun. But I think the impact, what makes up for that is the impact that I have, the, the way I can help people. And it's also at this stage of my career, um, it's also very, very flexible. So I have mm -hmm. two daughters in their 20s who live um, in other cities. One lives in Philadelphia and one lives in Portland. And you know, if I want to take the day off and go visit one you of can. them, I, yeah, it's, it's completely flexible and that's pretty nice. Um, so it kind of makes up for the fact that, that I miss being able to be a leader more regularly. Yeah, absolutely. So talking about personality traits and struggles, uh, what has been the worst day of your career as a career coach? You know, I, I literally haven't had that day. Oh, my goodness. I, I know. I really, <laughs> I've been scratching my head. You were nice enough to send me some of your questions ahead of time. And so I've literally been scratching my head about that because I've never, I, I mean, I'm sure I've had days where you know, things were just kind of so-so. They weren't fabulous, and I didn't, you know, help mm -hmm. someone land the job of their dreams. But I've never had a horrible day, ever. Well, that's that, definitely not... a perk. <laughs> I know. And I kind of w I wish I could think of something. And, you know, and, and then you, you also asked about the best day, and I, yep. I have – I definitely can come up with two best days and they're kind of on the, both on the opposite end of the spectrum. So one of those best days was when a client I've worked with for about five years um, was juggling four job offers. Oh my goodness. And I know, and that never happened before. In fact, I never, <laughs> even with, I never even worked with a client juggling four three job offers. So that was an amazing, that was just a fun, amazing day. And then the other great day was a couple of years ago, a client I had worked with for at, probably at least five years who had just had so many struggles, mm -hmm. um, struggles with depression, struggles with unemployment, struggles with friends. I mean, you name it. And he had finally gone back to finish up his degree. It took him, I think he graduated undergrad when he was maybe about 31. Mm -hmm. And, and then looking for a job was also really hard for him because he's very introverted, um, doesn't naturally connect with people. And I have to say the day he landed a job that he really loves I, I'll never forget that day. That, that was a very happy day and it still makes me happy to think about that. So though, those are the two best days, but you know, seriously, I love my job so much that I could pick any day. And it would probably be the best day. You can probably tell I'm sort of a positive person. What can well, I say? Well, that's good. I mean, that's exactly 
I mean, that's what we're looking for, right? That's what people want. Yeah. The fact that you help people find probably, arguably, one of the most important things in their life, right? Yes. It's, I mean, I can understand why that would, you know, where it wouldn't really ever be that bad because you're helping right. them find these things that they love. So, right. I mean, that's, that's great. That's, that's a, that's exactly what we're looking for. Yeah. So what do you love most about what you're doing? Um, the fact that I really help people. Yeah. That, that that's, that's it. P- pure and simple. The fact that I help people is just huge. That keeps me getting up every morning and keeps me happy with what I'm doing. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah, absolutely. And feeling accomplished. I mean, every day somebody else gets something they're looking for. It makes you feel accomplished in what you're doing, you know, value. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's true too. So I know we talked about, you said you were at the, you know, you were heading towards the end of your career. I'm assuming you don't have any expansion plans. Are you kind of ramping it down? Is that where you're heading right now? Are you going towards retirement or are you going to keep the shenanigans up for a while? Oh, I think I'll be keeping the shenanigans up for a really long time. I, I honestly, <laughs> can't, I cannot imagine not doing this. Um, the only thing I've been thinking about is... Um, and partly because, as I mentioned, one of my daughters lives in Portland. I've mm-hmm. sort of thought about just expanding a little bit and maybe doing more workshops in Portland and, you know, just seeing if I can spend a little more time down there doing career coaching. So still doing what I'm doing, but just um, instead of being just focused mostly in Seattle, I'll so expanding into Portland. So I'd say that's the only thing I've thought about. I haven't really done much about it, but I'm thinking about it. You're, you're, you're harboring the thought. You're, you're yes. Okay. Yeah. That, I mean, that makes a lot of sense though. And that, that's probably a big positive of what you're, you know, owning your own business is that you can do that so that it benefits you seeing your daughter a little bit more, but still doing what you love. Yes, exactly. Very cool. Yeah, that's, I mean, and with no bad days, there's no reason to stop, right? No, I can't imagine stopping, honestly. (laughs) Okay, so we've really delved into um, being a career coach and a lot of the practices you use, which are going to be great for more than people than just wanting to be a career coach, because you've given a lot of really good advice for people just wanting to find something they love. Um, So I just have a couple more questions for you. What did you want to be when you were a kid? (laughs) Um, well, I really love dogs and I always have. And when I was little, I thought I was either going to be a vet or a dog trainer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then, and, and then there was the whole thing with science. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, no, I don't think I'm going to be a vet. <laughs> <laughs> no, the vet's out the window. But, I mean, dog training could have still happened, right? That's yeah, still I, still been, I still could have been a dog trainer. And when I think about, like, what I want to do when I'm really old, I think <laughs> about I think about being one of those people that takes therapy dogs into universities at exam week or into assisted living homes. Oh, that would be or, really cool. Or that, I, I just think that would be so, or hospitals, like children's hospitals, taking dogs in to see children in hospitals. I think that would be so much fun. So that's, maybe that's the expansion plan for my career. <laughs> You'll go back to your childhood dreams and bring yes, them back to life. exactly, Samantha. I think I that's totally it. it. I love it. Uh, so what is the, what's the best piece of business advice you've ever received? Well, so I have two favorite quotes. One, one is from um, Charles Kettering, who was the former CEO of General Motors and just a sort of legendary 20th century business leader. And it's not even that, you know, dynamic a quote, but I really agree with him. He said, a problem well stated is a problem half solved. And I just think that is such a beautiful truth about um 
I, I just find so often that when someone comes to me and they're just tied up in knots and I have them just literally lay out for me, you know, what are all the things that are wrong with this picture? Let's, mm -hmm. let's really name what the problem is. And by the time we do that, we're halfway towards solving it. So that, yeah. that's my number one. And my number two is a quote from um, the aviator, Amelia Earhart. Yeah, okay. She said, the most effective way to do it is to do it. <laughs> That's and the truth. I just love that. It's like, you know what? Stop diddling around and making your plans and talking to people. Just go and do it. Just go and do it. That's it. Yes. So, yes. yeah, that's pretty much, that's really all I have for you, Samantha. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I, can, I relate to it because I sat for probably eight months on the idea for this podcast. And I was like, I need to learn audio and I need to learn all these things. And I wasn't really learning it. And finally, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do it and we're going to see what happens because Woo! worst Good case scenario, you. it sounds horrible and nobody listens, but um, <laughs> at least it's out there, right? Well, exactly. <laughs> and until you do it, you just don't know. So I'm thrilled that you're doing it. I think this will, this podcast is going to be really helpful to people. I'm, I'm hoping so. That's the, this is, this is my passion project. This is my hope that I can reach a couple people to help them see something a little bit differently. I good. Okay. Well, good luck to you. I think you're, you're off and running and I, it was great. To, it was really fun to talk to you. You too. Thanks for coming on my show, Elizabeth. You're welcome. If you like this episode or you're looking to change your career, go to 28 com or become a patron to get exclusive content sent directly to you. See you next week.